Now, on to games. I love games, especially mind games. Uh, the next category is the Games Award. The nominees are as follows. The Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time, developed and published by Nintendo. Up until that point, like, Ocarina of Time was the biggest game, you know, ever. With the development of another Nintendo console came the development of another Zelda game, Ocarina of Time for the N64. Miyamoto enlists a team of more than 100 programmers, designers, and artists. There were 325,000 pre-orders for the title. And Miyamoto is honored by his peers as the first recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences. Zelda is such a big touchstone for gaming and then to work on a sequel you know i kind of crossed over to the other side ocarina of time set the stage for yet another zelda game to take the franchise into the next century the legend of zelda majora's mask for the n64 is coming october 26th my editor recommended that i work with the localization team and mr miyamoto to rework the script for western audiences it was definitely a big responsibility because it's going line by line. It's like, I just want to make it just perfect. We have Zelda's Majora's Mask. How is this game different than Miyamoto's masterpiece, man? Everybody knows that it's Zelda, Ocarina of Time, you know, one of the best games of all time. It was just thousands and thousands of lines of dialogue. You know, that was the big part that I had to deliver on, was really doing justice to his story, to the characters making everything just right. This is like the sequel to one of the biggest games ever. Don't mess this up. Well, everybody in the world's waiting for this one, man. Can't wait. They were looking for a writer for Nintendo Power Magazine. I got to college for communications and journalism and writing and advertising. So I knew that's what I wanted to do was uh, get into writing. Um, and of course I loved video games. So I applied, um, they had me submit some writing samples and they brought me in and then they actually, part of the interview was they sat me down with the Super NES and they had me play Donkey Kong Country 3. And they just had me play through a couple levels and then write some strategy and, and some, some review copy about it. Um, and that was like a, I think like a 20 minute test on site just to do that. I ended up getting the job and I got hired on as a staff writer for Nintendo Power Magazine. It was my first job and everybody was, you know, they, we were all in our 20s and we were all just playing video games all day and then getting to write about it. It was an amazing time to, to be there because I was there during, like, right after the launch of N64 and then I was there during the launch of GameCube and all along the way there were all these different iterations of Game Boy, Game Boy Advance. Um, Pokemon had just launched when I started. That was really cool to see that whole thing pick up because, you know, everybody was like, oh, this is kind of weird. I, you know, they got all these weird Pokemon names. He's going to like this. And it just, it blew up. Yeah, I mean, I was a huge Zelda fan. Link's Awakening was, was one of my favorites. It's still one of my favorite games. One of the first articles I wrote when I was at Nintendo Power was Link's Awakening. Um, they had re-released that. I, I played through that game all, all over again, and then I, I, I wrote the magazine strategy, which, which spanned a couple of issues. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was, I was very deep into Zelda. Um, when Ocarina of Time came out, that was such a huge deal. This is the latest footage of Zelda, possibly the most eagerly awaited N64 title of them all. As you can see, it looks pretty much completed. So where is it? 
There is so much anticipation for the new game that the Guinness Book of World's Records officially recognizes the Ocarina of Time as having more pre-orders than any other game in history. 350,000. Zelda 64 is going to be one of the biggest selling games ever for their system. Graphics, the music, the gameplay, everything is much better. It'll be the single biggest selling piece of video game software in history. Why is this going to be the game of the year? We think Zelda 64 could well be the biggest game ever. My goal was to make a place for players that would be very different from the real world. The Nintendo 64 lets me realize this goal better than ever before. It was Mr. Miyamoto who wanted to get it right, so he's taken his time to create this game. You're going to see Link's age from a young boy to a teenager. You'll see night change into day as you play through the game. It's just a lot of effects, and it's really starting to take advantage of the full power of the N64. Good yet. The Legend of Zelda. Japanese release date is said to be imminent. When we wrote the magazine, we would get, you know, we would get to play the early ROM versions of the game because when the magazine hit the stands, we had to have the articles ready for when the game actually went live. So we were playing very early versions before they got game tested. So I remember playing Ocarina of Time very early on and just being just astounded at how massive a game that was. I also do remember um, paying attention to the dialogue and, and all the text. I mean, Dan Osen had been localizing that game for a while. Previously, all the localization was done by Dan Osen. He did like the previous four games. Um, we were basically in the, the same kind of cubicle space. So there was the, the print magazine and then the digital team. And then I would say things to, to Dan and saying like, do you think this, this makes sense? Um, I remember I, I, I called out, what was it? It was like the diving tunic or something, but there was, the, he made a reference to scuba diving. And I was being kind of nitpicky about it, saying like, that's not technically scuba because scuba diving requires the actual self-contained underwater breathing apparatus and you're not using that. And he, and, and he was a good sport about it. Like, I remember, um, you know, like Dan would spend, you know, a month or so in Japan just to work directly with the, you know, with, with Mr. Miyamoto and the team at NCL, which is Nintendo Corporate Limited, and that's the Japan headquarters. Um, meanwhile, we're all playing updates of the ROMs for Ocarina of Time, and they would keep updating it with his latest text. But I, I remember, even back then, I, I really really paid special attention and I really cared about the dialogue. Uh, it was very serendipitous that it actually then happened where the next game I'd be the one localizing it. There's a new Zelda game coming out. It's called The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. When Majora's Mask came through, Dan, he was managing Nintendo.com, so he didn't really have a lot of time to do it anymore. My editor, she really liked my writing, so she she recommended that I, I work with um, the localization team and Mr. Miyamoto to um, rework the, the, the script for Western audiences, and everybody was really cool with that. They were really excited to have me do that. We started right before it actually came out in Japan. All of that was just, it was overwhelming. It was incredibly humbling to be asked to work on Zelda. I mean, those are big shoes to fill. Everything that I had played, you know, like the, the, the more recent games that I had played, those were, those, those were Dan's words and now I was working with him and he was kind of uh, passing the baton to me. So they, they pulled me off the magazine for a couple months and just sat me down with the ROM of Majora's Mask and I would just play through it all, you know, like over and over, um, you know, to find every possible ending and talk to all the different characters. And then 
they gave me a separate laptop where all the Japanese text lived. That's how they did all the game text was that there was this exported and imported from an Excel file. So it was this thousands and thousands of lines of, of dialogue. And I was working with Bill Trinan, who was in the localization uh, team, and he's very fluent in Japanese. He went through all the different blocks of copy and he just translated them from Japanese to English. And then I went in there and I had my own column and I would go in line by line, trying to extrapolate um, what the story is or what the nuances are, or just spice it up with, with a more conversational style and come up with the different ways that the, the different characters would deliver their lines, different personalities and things like that. That was like a real intense uh, few months of me just uh, working every day and weekends. It was a lot of work because I mean, you could I, you could never see the end of the text. It was just ten thousand rows of of, of copy, and, and it was I was never getting to the bottom. There's a, there's a lot of the enemies from Ocarina of Time, and, yeah. and the dungeons are are bigger and better. Link can actually put on masks and become different characters. Oh yeah, there's 20 different masks, and they all have a special thing that they can do. Right. And you have to use all of these in order to get to certain places. I it was considerably a lot more dialogue because if you can imagine the game, it's like there's all those characters and then all the masks. So there's one tree of dialogue for when you were just regular Link, but then when you're wearing a different mask, they're going to have a different reaction. So there's there's all these kind of, you know, everything kind of spider webs out. What they would do is they'd always update the ROMs like every day with new text that they got from NCL, which is Nintendo uh, Corporation Limited in Japan. I started out playing in the Japan, you know, where it was all Japanese text, and then eventually, English started started uh, getting sprinkled throughout, and then I could start getting through the game a lot easier because it's like, okay, now I understand what they're asking for. And I remember, like, one of my friends would she she came over to talk to me um, about lunch, and she saw that I had the computer. And I was like, oh, okay, Jason's deep in the Zelda stuff. There's a time thing involved in this game. Now explain that to us. What has happened is uh, the school kid from. Zelda, yeah. uh, Ocarina of Time, had taken his mask, called the Majora's Mask. Right. And now he has doomed a planet, uh, like a little dimension. And this moon is about to crash land and destroy the whole entire planet in three days. Like, I don't know how many times I've gone through that three-day cycle and seen the moon crash and all of that, but I played it a lot of times um, for a couple months on end. I think the favorite line, of course, were, were, the, were, were the two Skull guys um, at Iconic Castle. I do remember like the, the whole feeble line. That was something that was a direct translation. And then I really just ran with it and played with it. And I know there's, there's a couple parts where it just says feeble and there's a lot of ease. Um, I really just ran with that whole line and just made that a recurring um, thing that they kept saying when they were arguing. <laughs> I think the weirdest one is always going to be Tingle, the whole um, coming up with, with some sort of weird catchphrase, and then kind of explaining what he is, and kind of dancing around that without, you know, giving anybody any real answer about, about Tingle. I think that was the most fun part. I think a lot of the pressure was, you know, making sure that I was, you know, upholding the legacy and being reverent to it, but also, you know, being true to the script because it is such a dark game and there's all these characters who have just all this regret and sorrow and all this unfinished business. And then, but then still they're trying to go about their daily lives and just kind of live life while they can because they know that there's this impending doom and the and the moon is going to crash into their town and destroy things so you know i was trying to do that because i i think anybody you know would try and you know have some levity even though there's all this stuff hanging over them now a game that we know may be weighing on many of your minds zelda majora's mask yes this is the next installment in the highly successful and influential series that dates back all the way to the nest now zelda actually is a long yeah i mean there's a it was a big burden 
Ocarina of Time had just come out, you know, two years before. So, I mean, up until that point, like, that was the biggest game, you know, ever. And the winner of the Games Award is The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time! Gamers around the globe needed no persuading. The title has gone on to notch up sales of over 7 million worldwide, of which a million in Japan alone. It does what great films do and great novels do. It makes you feel a part of the action. Totally believable. Game in your it was just a big step forward. More than any other game, Legend of Zelda shows us exactly how good the N64 can be. Let's hope the sequel arrives soon. And then to work on a sequel, definitely I knew going in, like, okay, there's a lot to live up to. There's this whole, you know, there's 14, 14, 15 years of previous Zelda games. This is like the sequel to one of the biggest games ever. Um, don't mess this up. One of the things that makes the game really cool is that the whole time the clock is ticking. The moon is getting closer. I'm not going to stop any of that. You have so many things that you have to accomplish to stop this moon from falling. If you mess up even the least little bit on a couple of these things. I wanted to make sure that I was uh, doing everybody right because Again, I was really, you know, like as a magazine staffer, I'm still a gamer at, at, at heart, you know, like, and that's, that was my role. Like, I wanted to make sure that as a gamer, I was giving everybody the best possible experience and that I wasn't just writing it where I wanted it to be my voice or I wanted to put things in that felt like it was me because I didn't want to take people out of the story. So it kind of happened in two phases. The first phase, and this was a longer phase, was just me working in the uh, Redmond offices at, at Nintendo of America, just playing the game, writing all my text. And the goal was for me to write, you know, finish as much as possible before they flew me over to Kyoto at NCL, working directly with the Majora's Mask team. When I flew there, I mean, it was really cool for me because, you know, this was like really the first international business trip I had ever done. Um, I'd never been to Japan before. And then, you know, it's like I, I was by myself. It's not like they sent me with um, other team members or anything like that. It was, it was really helpful to actually be in Kyoto because all of the stuff that was around them, that's what inspired them. Like, even though this game takes place in Link's world, you could see all the parallels from their world in Kyoto, just walking around, seeing the temples, all the different motifs and, you know, design motifs, like the, the Keaton mask, that little fox mask, Triforces, all those things you would just see around in the wild, like emblazoned on temples or on archways and, and columns. So we arrived in the offices and it felt very much like a school or a hospital. You know, it was, it was a very stark white building. It, it's a very unusual kind of contrast or juxtaposition to the creativity that's coming out of that building. It was Mr. Anuma, the two main producers, and then Mr. Takano, who was the script writer who wrote the original Majora's Mask. and. and came up with all the characters and everything. We sat down in the Majora's Mask team, mapped it out on a whiteboard and walked me through the story and just the feeling and just also like the backstory of, of how they came about it, which was, you know, it was very much, Mr. Takano had just gotten married. He's a newlywed, but then he's spending all this time away from his wife working on this new game. So a lot of the story for him, as well as everybody else working um, on the game in, in the Kyoto office, um, it was about them being away from their loved ones, being isolated, feeling alone. But that was a big thing that he really wanted to convey. And, um, you know, and I was aware of that. I, th I think anybody's aware of that playing the game, but really understanding that subtext that it's coming from every character in the game, 
as well as Link, who's very much alone, you know, separated from his regular world. And he's the one who's having to go through things so many times, but none of these characters are even aware of it. You know, it, it's it's a weird sort of bittersweet, um, melancholy mood that really had to be conveyed through the dialogue. You know, that was the big part that I had to deliver on, was really doing justice to his story, to the characters, um, you know, it's making everything just right. But it, it, it was just interesting to see all of that and then also be feeling kind of the same things that those guys were going through when they created the game. Because um, I was, you know, I was in a new country, I was, I was removed from all my friends. It was interesting because I, I all of a sudden, you know, I got the context without them having to really um, write it out for me or, or give me a formal presentation. I was in their world where I could understand their mindset of, of where all this came from. And that was really a span of a couple weeks, just in Kyoto, working with them. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely felt very intimidated and nervous. Mr. Takano, who was a script writer. I mean, he's a, he's, he's a great, easygoing guy, but I just felt like I don't want to let him down. I worked very closely with him and then my translator, who was Mr. Goto. It was basically the three of us just sitting in an office at a big, big table for, you know, long, you know, like 12 hour days, um, five days a week, scrubbing through all the copy, line by line, um, Mr. Goto would translate it to Mr. Takano, who then would just make sure that it was upholding his his story. There, there are definitely like specific words that they would take issue with and I'd, ha I'd have to explain to them, okay, well, in in English, it's it, it doesn't really have the connotation that you think. There are different things like that, but um, there are definitely you know little nuances that I missed. Still, the the main example I think was like the mayor's wife. Um, I, I referred to her incorrectly, so it it made all the relationships really incestuous, which it shouldn't have been. I had a lot of fun coming up with band names for the Zora Band. Um, while I was in Kyoto working with the team there, I came up with a bunch of different names and I was, I was bouncing it off of Mr. Anuma and, and them. And they got a good chuckle out of Indiegogo's and then that kind of stuck. They, they ended up liking that. It was originally Blue Swamp, which was what Mr. Anuma's name sounds similar to in Japanese. When translated in Japanese, his name sounds like whatever the Japanese word is for Blue Swamp. It's cool enough, but it didn't really sound like a cool band name, so I wanted to come up with something that could be kind of fun for American audiences. Every line was scrutinized by so many people, um, but where everybody was going through me to then get it uh, fixed and revised uh, uh, you know, according to whatever um, changes they needed. Then after the, the, the whole Kyoto phase, then I went back, we shifted gears at the magazine to start writing the player's guide so that I'd be playing through seeing now all of my text in the game. It was really unusual because, um, you know, I kind of crossed over to the other side, you know, like now, now we're writing about a game that I had worked on. Those are my words, you know. I always felt paranoid, like, you know, they're playing my game now and we're all writers here. I hope they like it, you know? And, and it was always like, like, I, like I, you know, I, I did my best. I hope you guys like what I did, you know? And, and to anybody who, who is a Zelda fan, like, I hope I, I did it okay, you know? Um, that's all I can ask for, but um, definitely I felt that there, you know, like at, at the magazine, now that they're reviewing the game that I, that I did a big part of.
Majora's Mask was just released for the N64 and is looking to take Zelda to the next level. Zelda, Majora's Mask for N64. Some consider it a sequel to the greatest video game ever. Others claim that it's much better than the original. The story and gameplay are embraced by fans worldwide. The gameplay is very in-depth, and there's so many things to do. Majora's Mask quickly becomes a bestseller. Well, if you want to talk value for your money, Zelda always comes through. Miyamoto yes, always comes absolutely. through. absolutely. Being a sequel to the best video game of all time wouldn't be a bad thing for itself. But at the same time, the legend of Zelda and Majora's Mask is much more than a sequel. Yeah, I mean, it was so exciting because, I mean, it was like, I, I mean, I was telling all my friends, like, you have to play this game, it's amazing, and it's like, you know, those are my words, but it's like, beyond that, like, the game is so much bigger than that. It was just, it was such a great game, just the concept of it, just the whole story, um, that I wanted all my friends to play it regardless, but it was, I mean, that was just icing that um, they'd be reading my words. Very similar to Ocarina of Time, which I think is still the best Zelda game that, that Miyamoto has made. And I give it a 7.8. I, I can only give this game a 9 out of 10, as right. opposed o to the, Only a 9 out of well, 10. <laughs> I, it, usually when I play a Zelda game, I'm expecting it to be a 10 out of 10. It was a tougher game because it was a darker and harder game for a lot of Zelda fans to get into. And I think that was the tougher thing for me was that, you know, it would never be as big as Ocarina of Time. And it was also following up that game so quickly that, you know, there was hype, but it still was, I think a lot of people were dismissing it as just kind of a small spinoff game. There were those who realized, okay, there's a very different and um, gameplay in here, and it's such a deeper journey. Majora's Mask has been with me through life's hardest moments. Through every breakup, every time my mental health has tanked, or when I've moved cities or even countries and had no friends to hang out with. It's the game I will consistently pick back up and use to help me to get past whatever is going on. The fact that they made this game in one year and managed to pull off this whole cool time travel loop with all the masks, with all their functions, and then the transformations, different types of gameplay, it's so impressive. Um, I love it. I really, really love this game. Out of all the Zelda games, I feel really proud and privileged to be associated and to have worked on Majora's Mask because I think that's the one that I would have picked. Second choice would have been probably Link's Awakening, but to be associated with Majora's Mask, especially now, I think now people really single it out as being just a great game. The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask is what I like to regard as one of my favorite video games of all time. I quickly became enamored with nearly every aspect of this game. Its gripping time mechanic, its dark themes, its wonderful characters, and its exhilarating story. It's weird because when I play the game now, I don't even feel like it's my words or my voice, which is a good thing because I would never want to play it and feel like, oh, this is very much my writing. Everybody came together and really made this game work. But I think that's that's what makes me most proud is that I can just play through the game and I'm not getting hung up on the words or feeling like that's such a Jason thing. I, I'd say Zelda Majora's Mask, at its core, it's a story about relationships and people and not getting hung up on regrets and not letting that eat you up. How can you keep moving forward? But it's really a story about Link becoming the catalyst and becoming the hero who helps all of these characters in this world. And then by the end of the game, he is able then to also move on and return to his life. As fond as I am of that experience, it was definitely a big responsibility. But yeah, I think it probably made me a better writer for it and made me try harder to write it. You know, I'm, I'm pretty proud of that. And I see like a lot of websites where they have 
um, you know, like all these quotes from the game and, and people are making, you know, still making memes and all, all the, the, the different quotes of, you know, you've met with a terrible fate, haven't you? Or Tingle, Kula Limpa, all, all that stuff like that was established in that game and it still lives on. And that's something that I'm still blown away by and really humbled by that how beloved the game still is.